Okay, so good morning everyone. So a warm welcome to everyone who is able to join today's webinar. And we as IMU third students, we are excited to collaborate with MPDA for arranging this webinar on Parkinson's medication and treatment. A big thanks to the MPDA president, Ms. Sarah, and our supervisor, Dr. Sagi, for making this happen. First and foremost, I would like to introduce the group members and I. So I'm Farheen, and my group members are Jani, Juzi, Minghao, and Milisha. Minghao and I will be the MC for today's webinar, so please feel free to contact any of us in case of any question that may arise within this talk through the chat box. To begin with, I would like to share some housekeeping rules to enable a smooth run during this talk. So first, upon joining this, this Zoom meeting, your screen sharing, audio, and video will be turned off automatically. And during this webinar, should you have any questions for the speaker, you can post your questions through the Zoom Q&A chat box. If you need any assistance, please approach our committees that have COMM in their username. And lastly, please do remember to fill in the feedback form at the end of the session. So this webinar will take around one and a half hours. After this opening session, Dr. Wong will proceed with the webinar talk where she will talk in detail about Parkinson's medication and the treatments. So her talk will take around 40 minutes and then we will have a question and answer session for 20 minutes before wrapping up this webinar. Feel free to post all your questions in the Zoom chat box so that we can answer all your queries at the end of this session today. For our main speaker today, we're honored to have Dr. Wong Paisi. So she will share with us on Parkinson's medications and treatment, and she will talk in details on that sector. So Dr. Wong is a senior lecturer of School of Pharmacy at IMU with 20 years of experience of teaching. She is currently also the Associate Dean of Teaching and Learning at the university, and she is a registered pharmacist in Malaysia. She has a special interest in research in pharmacy education and extended roles of pharmacists. So I will, here is her email address in case you may need further clarification regarding this talk afterwards. Feel free to contact her, she's very helpful and I'm sure she will be glad to offer help in future. So now I will welcome Dr. Wong to take over. Thank you. Okay, um, am I, are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. Good morning, everyone. I think um, 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 it's a Saturday morning. I mean, glad to see that uh, many are able to, able to join this talk. And of course, I'm glad to be able to share with you uh, some of the related things about uh, Parkinson medication. All right, okay, I'm gonna just uh, on my slide, okay. Um, um, as mentioned, uh, I'm a registered pharmacist uh, in Malaysia and I'm currently also a lecturer in uh, international medical universities. I think this is my second talk uh, uh, for, for the Society on Parkinson Medicine. I think I did one actually last year as well. And um, there were a lot of questions, uh, you know, relating to everyone's uh, own medications. Um, I just like to highlight that a lot of uh, things that we mentioned today are probably quite general in that sense and to give you a pictures or more like a knowledge about the medication, why they are used and some of the principles when you're using the medication. Uh, if you have any inquiries specific to your own medication and all that, I think um, we will try our best to uh, you know, discuss with you today. But of course, any medication is quite individual for uh, individual for each person. Sometimes if we are needing to give you more advice on a specific or comment on your specific medication, we may need more information from you as well. So uh, if we are not able to answer it today, we might, uh, if you're interested, you can always email us or provide information to us. We can reply to you, uh, you know, by email or by writing uh, so that, uh, you know, it's, it, it, so that we are not misleading and giving you the wrong information as we go. All right, um, I think just to uh, start with, of course, all of you, uh, you know, some of you may be on medication for Parkinson disease already, and, and, and perhaps uh, you might be on it for quite a long time. And there is always uh, questions, you know, sometimes it's, uh, why are you using Parkinson medicine? You know, how far it can work? Uh, we know that uh, medication for Parkinson are not able to completely reverse um, the problem. You know, we know that it's not aiming at, at trying to, you know, totally 
um, um, completely resolve the problem, but a lot of time it's more for controlling of the symptoms, you know, example, tremor, um, slowness of your um, movement, which is what we call bradykinesia, stiffness, inflexibility. And of course, depending on what medication and how you use it, you know, they are also extend on how much you can control and also depending on your severity of problem. And as much as possible, a lot of doctors, when they start you on a med pass, uh, Parkinson medication, I think their aim is really to maintain you to the functional of daily activities. Mainly what I'm saying here is example, your how you take care of yourself, uh, walking, you know, walking uh, safely, not falling, and of course performing some of the basic jobs that you might be able to still do, you know, and of course in early stages, normally this type of problem, uh, I mean, it's quite easy to get that uh, into daily activity. And of course, at severe, where as it's severe, it might get a bit more problematic to control. But having said so, I think a lot of studies has indicate that the medication can help slow down the progression, you know, which means that if you're on medication a bit earlier, you might be able to uh, prevent that the Parkinson disease from going uh, too severe at at, at, at a very short time. So you might be able to still sustain some lifestyle activity and daily activity for a while, for a period of time before, you know, you're completely not able to perform some of the things safely in that sense. Okay, so, um, and of course, like I said, I think it depends on individual as well, how much control that they gain. Okay, um, what I'm, I like to share with you here is like a few minutes of video uh, about a Parkinson uh, disease. So just to give you a little bit of idea about Parkinson disease and what causes it. Okay, uh, and that would help us to build a little bit of understanding about um, um, for some of you that may not be completely knowing, you know, what causes the Parkinson. And of course, this is the video from US, so you can omit the last part about, you know, where you can visit and find out more about that. Hi, I'm Dr. Rich. Okay, can, is, the, uh, is the sound audible? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Rachel Dolan, Vice President of Medical Communication. at the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. I'm also a movement disorder specialist, which means I'm a neurologist with specialized training in Parkinson's disease, or PD. Today, I'd like to discuss a question that is essential to our foundation's work. What is Parkinson's disease? Let's start with some basics. In the United States, it is estimated that anywhere from 600,000 to 1 million people or more are living with Parkinson's, and at least 60,000 are diagnosed each year. This makes PD one of the most common brain diseases, second only to Alzheimer's. Age increases the risk of Parkinson's, and the average age of diagnosis is 60. So as our population continues to grow older, more people are likely to experience PD. In fact, people tend to think of Parkinson's as an older person's disease, but some get PD at 40 or even younger. Some diseases can be diagnosed with a lab test. Cholesterol levels and blood pressure are measured to evaluate for heart disease, for example. We need tests like that in Parkinson's, but they don't exist yet. Doctors diagnose Parkinson's by completing a medical history and a physical examination. They look for two of the three classic motor symptoms, which are resting tremor, stiffness, and slowness of movement. When people hear about Parkinson's, they mostly think of these motor symptoms especially tremor. But some people also experience walking and balance problems, and PD affects other body systems. Constipation, sleep problems, cognitive changes, and depression can occur, sometimes even before a Parkinson's diagnosis. And some people report that they lose their sense of smell. One of the hardest things about Parkinson's is that everyone with the disease embarks on a unique journey. In fact, movement disorder specialists say, if you've met one person with Parkinson's, you've met one person with Parkinson's. Each person has their own mix of symptoms and there is no standard trajectory or path. So if everyone gets their own version of Parkinson's, then what does everyone with PD have in common? To answer that, let's take a look inside the brain. In Parkinson's, the brain cells that make dopamine stop working or die. Dopamine is a signaling chemical or a neurotransmitter that coordinates movement as well as feelings of motivation and reward. When dopamine cells die, Parkinson's symptoms emerge. Exactly why these cells die is not well understood. 
Researchers believe that in most people, Parkinson's is likely caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. But although certain environmental factors, such as pesticides and head injury, are associated with an increased risk of PD, in most people there is no clear exposure we can point to as a straightforward cause of their Parkinson's. Similarly, while genetic mutations are linked to an increased risk of Parkinson's, based on what we know today, the vast majority of cases are not directly related to genetics. However, the field of genetics is moving fast. In Parkinson's, as in many other diseases, tremendous research is focused on genetics because this is our best opportunity to uncover paths to treatment breakthroughs. But how do we treat Parkinson's today? Here's what I told my own patients when I was a doctor in clinical practice. The currently available PD medications can't slow or stop the progression of the disease, but they can ease symptoms and help you continue doing much of what you have always done. The same goes for certain surgical procedures, which are a good option for some people. The most important point is that treatment regimens need to be individualized, so you should work closely with your doctor to determine what medication or combination of therapies work best for you and your symptoms. Speaking of doctors, our foundation urges people with PD to see a movement disorder specialist if possible. Many people don't get to these experts, and we'd like to change that, because the right doctor can help optimize your Parkinson's care, update you on research and drug development, and direct you to clinical trials, which are vital opportunities for you. Okay, all right, we're gonna just stop here. All right, um, okay, all right. So I hope the video give you some ideas about uh, Parkinson problems and, um, you know, how pa Parkinson, um, what, what is the cause of the Parkinson and how the medication is used and the importance of, of course, follow up with um, your own doctors uh, to monitor and also to uh, adjust your medication accordingly. But a lot of th times, I think, um, I think the emphasis on the medication itself, I think a lot of time is mainly on that uh, it's very individualized, you know, so which means it everyone has a very different path in, in the path of Parkinson's disease. So everyone may have be laying in mild, moderate or severity and the symptoms and the pattern that generated can be very different. Hence the reason why there is always an emphasis of individuality. All right. Okay. I think we're going to just do a very short poll. If you are looking at your screen at the moment, okay, you might see something popping up. Okay. So if you've been listening to the video, I hope you can, you would be able to answer this. All right. So uh, the question is asking, which neurotransmitter okay, is the major culprit or major cause uh, that is causing the PD, uh, the Parkinson disease? So you can pick your answer. Uh, you know, uh, we will just uh, maybe have a 60 second and if you can uh, do that. Jenny, would you be able to show the results or monitor the uh, numbers? Uh, yeah, most of them chose uh, dopamine. Okay, wonderful. How many percent so far? Uh, 94 percent. Okay, wonderful. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So great. I think everyone has picked up uh, dopamine as the main um, you know, culprit of cause of Parkinson. All right. So if you... Okay, this is dopamine itself, you know, the, uh, how the chemical structure look like. I mean, I'm not intending that you must remember or how it looks like, but what I wanted to also highlight is that I think some people will be asking, you know, why can't we just give the uh, dopamine, you know, so uh, we have 64% will answer dopamine. Eh? Okay, so dopamine is the main culprit or main cause of the problem in uh, Parkinson's disease. Hence, the reason why a lot of medication are related to this dopamine itself. And, and I think the first question sometimes people ask, why can't you just give back whatever that I'm missing in, in, in my system? You know, my system lacks dopamine. Why can't you just feed me with dopamine? And that would solve a lot of side effects of medication or other chemicals, you see. Yeah, but the problem is that Dopamine itself cannot cross what we call the blood-brain barrier. Blood-brain barrier basically is like a, a vascular system within the brain. Okay? The brain itself has a lot of blood vessel, and we know drugs inside blood vessel will have to reach the brain. So if they are wanting to kill or, or, or heal 
or at least uh, work on a Parkinson, the medication will have to be able to reach the site of the brain itself. So the vascular system or the blood vessels within the brain itself are the mechanism to transport all this medication. But the problem is that our brain, or maybe not a problem, but the interesting and unique thing is that the brain are very protected. They had an extra layer in the blood vessel system itself, what we call blood brain barrier, so that not everything can reach the brain, you know, so easily in that sense. So a lot of times that when we design a medication to reach to the brain for the effect in the brain itself, you require special or different molecule. Example, the molecule cannot be too big. So your chemical structures cannot be too big, otherwise it cannot cross over to the brain side. You know, similarly, if you are uh, water soluble and things like that. So they are prerequisite for chemical or any structures to be able to cross and get into the system. So hence the reason why if you are giving a feeding a person with dopamine, unlikely it will reach the brain. Hence the reason why I think the discovery started. I think what people uh, start to then uh, wanting to discover is that how do I design a medication you know, that could cross and make it work for the Parkinson disease. So I, I think interestingly, Levodopa is only available in the market or be, being introduced in the market actually for 60 years only. You know? So if you are comparing to a lot of medication that we're talking about and all that, I think Levodopa is one of the most longest uh, long stay and it remained as the main, main medication in Parkinson's disease because it has very closely structured like a dopamine. Hence, a lot of doctors and a lot of uh, studies have shown that how it worked very well within the, uh, for the Parkinson disease. So, and this level dopa itself are able to cross the blood-brain barrier. And if you look at the structure, they are very similar. So, what when we are taking, when someone is taking over the power, what you're aiming is that it will work like a dopamine. So it will help to sort of replace back whatever that is missing within the system, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, of course, after, uh, as I mentioned just now, levodopa is probably uncovered, being uncovered like about 60 years ago. And when people start, uh, you know, seeing that levodopa work very well, you know, they start to use a lot of patient and start patient use, start to use a lot. And then they slowly realize that the problem is that levodopa, when you gave it to a person, they actually start to appear to have a lot of side effects. All right. And these side effects is partly because this drug itself does not, and, and this levodopa uh, is the precursor. It, it actually, actually converts in the body to dopamine. But the problem is that what we wanted is that the conversion only happened in the brain, you see. We don't want the conversion to happen too much in the body system, which means your limb, your hand, your kidney, and things like that. You don't want it in the system itself. You only want that precursor. Uh, uh, level dopa to change to your dopamine when it reaches the brain. So because it actually affect the body and, and, and your body, of course, cannot recognize. So hence the reason why people are starting to get a lot of side effects from level dopa. And hence the reason why people then they are also, um, you know, studies then to look into designing something what we call, you know, level dopa, uh, you know, um, inhibitor, you know, and they in full, they're called the, the uh, dopa the carboxylase inhibitor. So this is basically inhibit or actually prevent the conversion of uh, level dopa to dopamine within the body system. It will only, it doesn't affect the brain very much is because this drug cannot cross the brain, blood brain barrier also. So it won't affect the, the Parkinson, but it will minimize some of the changes of the medication that happen in the body. By doing that, it reduces a lot of side effects of the levodopa. Hence the reason why you will realize that in the market, okay, they are uh, basically too popular, what we call a uh, levodopa inhibitor, all right, uh, benzorazide and also dopi, uh, uh, carbidopa. And that form the um, common medication called uh, madopa and cinnamate. You might be on one of it. And of course, this is from two different companies, basically. Like, so different company uh, went and designed their own and developed their own inhibitor and whenever and patient is taking levodopa they will always couple it with this inhibitor but of course later uh, as it goes now it's already 60 years since you know people start to really look into parkinson medicine and you will realize there are more and more newer one that is coming in okay but our talk today i will be focusing more on the level dopa partly because they are more commonly used and of course uh, as i said the newer medication example entacapon all right which is also called the uh, comt com uh, inhibitor example star level okay and that uh, is one of the also later developed medications 
medication uh, by adding a new medication into levodopa and carbidopa for people who are uh, probably having a more advanced Parkinson disease. I think as I said uh, just now, levodopa uh, product basically is one of the more common and mainstay in basically in Parkinson diseases uh, management. Uh, Madopa itself already, there are many different formulations, you know, because they are, they are common and, and everybody has a very different pattern and different severity and different uh, way that they might be needing to use this uh, Parkinson medicine. Hence the reason why the company also start developing different type of formula. So Madopa alone, you can find there is capsule. There are also what we call HBS capsule, which is like more extended capsule. You know, there are rapidly dispersible uh, uh, tablet, which is, you know, basically you can resolve in water, I think, and also the normal tablet that's generated. Okay. All right. There, there are different ways you could use this medication because it depends on what formula that you're looking at. If you're looking at capsule uh, form, normally you, we don't suggest that you break down or you chew them. All right. Okay, uh, unless for some reason you are not able to swallow, you know, because in severe cases of Parkinson, some patients may not be able to swallow. So you might want to pick up some medication, example, dispersible tablet. You know, this dispersible tablet actually you can dissolve it in water and drink it. So that would help for patients who are basically having swallowing problem, uh, maybe at the later stage. But if you are using capsule example, like more extended release, they will always remind you, you know, not only you have to swallow whole, you cannot chew, you cannot open, you can dissolve. Part of the reason is because once you actually open the capsule, it may lose the effect of the capsule itself. All right, uh, or the medication formula itself. You know, ju just like if you remember, you know, you far more Panadol, you know, you will realize some medication uh, you can use a bit longer. You can, uh, you know, some medication you have probably um, extended release and things like that. So they are designed to actually release over time. So hence the reason why you're not about to chew. And of course, we have the normal tablet, you know, that could be for people that's just, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the most traditional um, conservative type of tablet. And they're also the same for Cinnamon. Okay, Cinnamon has also extended release. Okay, when it's extended release means it's a special formula. It's designed to release over time. Hence, you are always not allowed, uh, uh, suggest not to break down, not to crush, not to chew, swallow whole. Okay, and of course, for people that might have swallowing difficulty, then they might be uh, taking this integrating tablet. And this tablet, usually you put it on the tongue and they will melt. And, and it's always suggested that you actually uh, take it 30 minutes beforehand, which I will touch a little bit. Okay. Similarly for uh, Starlet, huh? all right, there are different strengths available as well. Okay. There's, of course, depending on which strengths you are on, there is always a cap of how much you are taking. And usually, um, as I understand this one, you'll be taking it usually more for uh, moderate or more to severe types of uh, Parkinson's disease. The interesting part about this Stalivon is that they, I mean, even actually for Madopa and Cinnamon as well, the norm, the norm, usually advice or even greater emphasis as that more is that you should always take one tablet at one time. Okay, I think the, the cautionary comes in is because that, you know, sometimes people will have to take up to like seven or eight tablets in a day. All right. But having said so, some patient may ask, you know, why can't I just take two tablets three times a day rather than take six times a day? Or can, why can't I just take two times, uh, two tablets a day, uh, two tablets one time and take four times a day rather than eight tablets at different frequency? Okay. For Stelvino itself, there is a caution that it's always suggested usually for you to take one tablet at each administration or each dose. Part of the reason is that they are worried about um, uh, first thing, overdosing the uh, medication itself. Okay, and of course, they are also concerned that does some medication when you are taking it at a very high dose, you may cause side effects very abruptly. Example, nausea, vomiting. You know, so hence the reason why they would uh, always advise that you probably should just take one tablet at each dosing or administration, and you shouldn't really break it into half when you take it. Okay, so um, as I mentioned just now, I think different medication will have different frequency. You know, example, uh, Madopa, Cinnamon, some usually would be between three to four times, but for Stelivon, sometimes it can be up to about uh, seven times, you know, seven tablets. But the general advice for it is that you should usually take 30 minutes 
before meal or even after, one hour after meal. Okay, so which means that you are cautioned not to take it with meal, okay, which I will mention a little bit. And of course, the dosing on how you take it, I think can be different for individual, but sometimes uh, the dosing itself may focus a bit more on daytime rather than night, which I can talk about it a bit later as well. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, so first of all, why do you advise or why do, should you actually take the medication before meal or even after, one hour after meal? When you take one hour after meal, of course, you're hoping that the meal will have digested a little bit. So the emphasis here in levodopa or, you know, most of this medication is basically take with empty stomach, you know. So the advice is actually try to empty your stomach when you take it. That's why if it's closer to your meal time, you either take it 30 minutes before the meal, because if you take it uh, even 15 minutes, right, your meal might still be there when you actually take the medication. So hence the reason why you should really have a buffer time at least 30 to one hour before and after meal so that you have a good absorption of the medication. I think that the main reason is because levodopa itself, uh, if you take it with a high protein meal or even high cholesterol meal, it might reduce the absorption of the medication. All right, so which means that if you take a meal with a lot of protein, when you take the level of part, the absorption of medication will reduce and that will obviously reduce the effect. So hence, best you take 30 minutes to one hour before meal. And of course, if you happen to take meal already, okay, try to then take maybe one hour after the meal, you know, let your food digest before you take it. But having said so, there are people or patients that sometimes they say, after the medication itself, I feel very uncomfortable. I get a bit of nausea, vomiting. So in that case, sometimes that, you know, they might ask that maybe why not you just try to take with meal. And in that case, basically, we will assume that there will be some uh, absorption reduction in, in in certain cases, we will need to adjust the medication accordingly. Usually when you take this over a long time period and you have a pattern on how to use it, usually it's a bit easier to regulate. But uh, for but of course, in general, if you wish not, if you wish for a best effect of the medication, you will try to use it, uh, um, take it without meal or we, uh, before the meal. All right, okay, but talking about the time uh, to effect, uh, this actually, uh, this is a very common question asked by a lot of um, uh, participants, even for last year. I think a lot of people ask whether you should be omitting it at night or you should uh, focus on daytime, whether you should spread it over 24 hours. Okay, the problem is that the effect is very varied among individuals, you know, whether you take three times, four times, does matter sometimes, you know, but the aim for the medication basically is that once you take the medication, all right, there will be a time, you know, if you can see the graph, huh? so the medication, once you take the uh, uh, Parkinson medicine, uh, basically, all right, there will be a time where the medication uh, dosing in your body will go up. And that's the time when the symptoms uh, go away, you see, yeah, and your symptoms will reduce. But slowly, we know that once the medication clear up from the system already, your symptoms will start to actually uh, come out, you know, like let's say you have varicinesia and tremor, the symptoms will actually start appearing again. And hence the reason why you need to have the medication taking at a frequency to make the medication or to make the system, uh, the symptoms go away, you see. And because of individual symptoms appearing and how their metabolism goes, it could be very different. So it would be very different for individual how the dosing goes as well. You know, whether you are going to take the dose before sleep or not, you know, which is which means that you want the medication to cover the night time as well. It depends sometimes whether do you have a lot of symptoms at night. Okay. Some in some cases, because the patient doesn't have a lot of symptoms at night, hence the reason why they may actually not take any medication closer, which means their last dose may not be necessary before the sleep time. But for some patients, because they have a lot of symptoms even at their sleep, and sometimes they are awake because of the same or of that symptoms, so they might be taking a night dose, you know, so that you can use the medication to cover the night and the symptoms will go away when you are asleep. And hence, then you won't wake up and you get a good sleep. But the other problem also with levodopa, which I will talk a little bit about, is that there are also there are also side effects of levodopa on insomnia, which means some people cannot actually sleep well when they take the uh, levodopa as well, and that can appear for some patient. And in that case, right, then you will need to adjust again, uh, basically the um, dosing so that you don't get the uh, insomnia at night. So I know that it's very complicated, but what I wanted to say is that the dosing interval, like whether you take three times daytime only or even closer to bed, very much if you want to have a good effect, 
you will need to adjust according to your uh, symptoms, uh, whether it how much it affects your sleep and you know whether the symptoms appear at sleep time or not. And hence the reason why a lot of time we say it's very individual. Uh, if you talk to your doctors a bit more and you, you can then learn how to adjust the medication accordingly. But in most, most cases, I think the doctor will start you at a low dose and slowly would increase and adjust it according to your condition. So what we aim for is that you will get as much as possible a, a reduction of symptoms, which means the symptoms will not affect your daily activity. And that would be the main base for the principle for adjustment of the medication. All right, let's talk a little bit about side effects of uh, levodopa itself. You know, levodopa itself, uh, we know that there are side effects. Okay, and um, of course, it affects some people more than uh, others. Okay, um, gastrointestinal or stomach problem perhaps is one of the more common side effects. According to some studies, it can be up to 70% to 90% of patients actually experience some sort of side effects in the stomach itself, all right, uh, due to the uh, medication levodopa, all right. And, and, and having said so, we like to emphasize that Parkinson disease patient might have gastrointestinal or stomach problem by itself already, which means that there are issues originally because of the Parkinson disease. So some patients may experience a lot of constipation. All right, but what we know a lot is that the major issue with levodopa usually relate to the stomach problem is the more concerned one is because of the delay of gastric emptying, which means that if you take a, a medication or you take a food, your stomach movement is going to be slower, you know, and, and that's quite visible usually when with levodopa. And of course, there are people who are getting, because of this, perhaps, you know, um, slow movement and all that, people might start to get nausea, vomiting, indigestion feeling, and some people may not even may get loss of appetite. Okay, so of course, if you have this type of problem, it depends, you know, um, yeah, um, uh, we know already, as I mentioned just now, it's best that you take medication, you know, empty stomach so that you don't delay the absorption of medication. So that's quite important. But at the same time, of course, if it's very, very prominent, you might need to adjust the dose accordingly. But the, the good part is that a lot of people usually like, you know, symptoms like nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite may actually uh, get better over time, you know, yeah. Um, the other um, side effects, of course, is the sleep problem. You know, some people up to about 30% might complain that they are a problem with sleeping. Example, uh, um, yeah, they cannot sleep well, okay? Um, which means that, you know, you are having problem to get into sleep, okay? And of course, some people, um, while when they sleep, they felt that they are more dreams as well, you know, vivid dreams, you know, nightmares. And hence the reason why when they wake up in the morning, they felt very tired. They felt very dizzy. So, and some of them may go into the excessive daytime sleepiness. So at daytime, they start to get very sleep, sleepy. You know, part of the reason is because the night they didn't get good sleep or they had a lot of nightmares and things like that. So hence the reason why they didn't good sleep. All right. And of course, insomnia sometimes could be also a problem related to Parkinson's disease patients themselves, you know, example, your anxiety, you know, your, your depression and all that. So that can actually affect the sleep quality as well. Yeah. So again, if you are having this type of problem, usually if it's really truly because of medication, adjustment of the dose itself might be helpful. Like I said, adjust the dose, maybe don't eat or don't take the medication so close to the, medica the, the sleeping time. So that might help a little bit in reducing. So that could be a try in that sense. Of course, other problem is the heart problem. Okay, uh, they are also intact levodopa can have on the heart, uh, example, a low blood pressure. Okay, and hence the reason why you should be very cautious, you know, like example, uh, when you stand up, you know, um, because uh, you will feel the dizziness when you actually slowly do a particular movement example. If you sit down and you stand up, you know, you might get experience more of the low blood pressure. And, but the more concerning is the irregular heart you know? and, and of course, my advice is that if you ever experience this after taking uh, levodopa or any of the medication, you should always seek the doctor help. And um, we know that the impact on the heart are probably more um, common or more, more uh, affecting those people that has already a, some sort of heart problem. You know, those who are having a healthy heart perhaps will have less of a problem in the um, cardiovascular or the heart itself. Okay, but of course, there, there are also other issues, uh, you know, relating to uh, mental health, which is basically, uh, which is levodopa is when you take the levodopa for a long period of time. 
All right. Um, this can be, um, I mean, I said it as long term, partly because it may not be so visible at far first, but uh, it can be actually happening slowly later. And this problem, you know, may sometimes be part of the confusion, partly because you, you, you might not know necessarily sometimes whether it's the Parkinson causing it or basically the medication is causing it. Okay, but over time, we know from documentation and literature that there has been documented already that the levodopa itself may contribute to anxiety, confusion, you know, maybe the sleep problem caused that as well. You know? and, and, and some patients or some people may actually felt that they are more delusion and hallucination. So you're imagining things that didn't appear or you're looking at something and you start thinking about something else. You know? yeah, so that, that can appear and happen. And of course, if you have experienced that, always talk to your doctors and that um, perhaps that require a further you know, um, um, uh, adjustment of medication or change of medication and things like that. The other thing is the involuntary movement that happened. You know, a lot of patients as they progress could be um, that the medication are starting to build up to certain level already. It may not work overly well and partly also because of the severity of diseases. Eh? So people start to get what they call uncontrolled movement. Okay, And this uncontrolled movement, if if, if the doctor is to investigate further, you know, the effect of levodopa, basically the side effects we're referring is usually the peak dose dyskinesia, which means that I just take my medication, but even though, you know, and, and the, the uncontrolled movement seems to be more appearing at the first one hour of the medication or even within the first two hours, all right, because uh, this is what we call the peak dose dyskinesia, which means that you have uncontrolled movement when your medication in your body actually reach their peak, all right? Okay, and this is actually known as the side effects of the medication. And of course, some people may not because of the movement itself. It because it, it may be involuntary contraction or spasm of the muscle itself. So the body that has a muscle movement, you felt that they are spasm, they are contraction uh, after taking it. And some people may felt uh, distress, you know, um, you know, get a bit for some reason it didn't feel right. And and some may be associated with pain as well. And of course, um, um, as progression goes, as Parkinson's disease gets severe and with ongoing medication as well, they might see appearing of the medication get weaning off a bit, wearing off fast, which means that the medication doesn't work very well anymore already. And you have very unpredictable uh, on and off, which means that in the past, maybe if you take three times a day or four times a day, it worked very well. Over time, it may not work as well. But again, I'm not trying to you know, um, paint you a picture that it's not something that you can deal with. What I'm emphasizing again is that, I mean, if you go back to the doctors and discuss it again, you would require adjustment of medication. As I said, we have more and more medication developed now. And you know, um, maybe it indicate that a person require more, uh, some adjustment of medication or even add on a medication to deal with it. Okay, And as I said again, I think this side effect sometimes is very confusing for a non-medical person to detect. You might need a doctor to do a very thorough investigation to know whether it's the side effects of medication or basically because of your Parkinson problem. So you may not know very clearly in that sense. Okay. So we, we, we talked about just now about levodopa. Um, levodopa is the mainstay of the uh, basically Parkinson disease and it, it converts the dopamine. And, and of course, we have medication, which is called, for uh, example, anticholinergic um, developed over time as well you know, for Parkinson. But I want to highlight or perhaps put a bit more emphasis on medication that relate to uh, uh, dopamine okay, um, a little bit. Okay. For example, I mean, we know that levodopa convert to dopamine in the body. And, and as I said, over 60 years of research, I mean, there are many other drugs developed. Okay, so some drugs are developed, basically example, you know, we mentioned just now, uh, entacapon. Okay, they are actually, their main mechanism is to prevent the breakdown of levodopa. So what they aim for is that, uh, you know, if people are taking levodopa, you take it together and catapon, it will increase the duration or the function or the use of the levodopa within the body system. So it prevent them from breaking down. Okay, and of course, there are also medication designed to prevent the breakdown of dopamine, okay, like selegine. So these are medication when used together, right, they basically are used as a junk, which means that you use it together with the levodopa. So a lot of time when you see that, uh, you know, someone is not controlled, they might add on on this type of medication, okay. The other add-on that is quite common is also like anantadine. Anantadine, because it can help to increase the dopamine release. For some patients who may require another, you no know, other adjustment or medication, there are also 
other drugs that's been designed that mimic dopamine, you know, example, um, Promipeso, you know, um, the Ropinirol, okay, uh, Requip, okay, or the Trivastar, if some of you are taking it. So these are all medication that they, they, what they do is they, they mimic the dopamine, but they are not the precursor like the Vadopa, okay. So hopefully, as mentioned, I think there are more and more medication that might be coming in and that might be helpful in Parkinson in future. All right, just a reminder, you know, in a sense is that, um, you know, if you are missing any dose of your levodopa medication, I think try to make sure that you um, um, take it as soon as possible, you know, um, you know, um, and, and of course, at all times, we, we will never suggest you double your dose. In any cases, part of the reason is because when you start doubling the dose, you might get more side effects you know, um, fall off the medication. And some of these side effects we are not something that we wanted and we will be worried about it, okay? And, and of course, at all times, do not stop your medication uh, without consulting your doctors. It's important that you try to stick to your regimen and if you require one adjustment and all that, you always discuss with doctors who know best how your condition goes, okay? And, and be able to also advise if you have developed other problem, example, like depression, anxieties, or you are having sleeping problem and all that. So do go back to see your doctors on green basis, okay? Um, I think the last uh, part that I wanted to say is that I think the Parkinson is, 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 is a very long-term problem. We know that. And um, I think there is a lot of medication that you need to take. And, and a lot of time, you know, um, we'll need to be able to comply and also follow the regimen accordingly. And, but, but having said, I think um, it's a problem that can be resolved uh, with some diligence in monitoring and also adjustment of medication. I think that's all from me, okay? Thank you. Are there any questions?